maybe there's an opportunity for us to look at our, our teaching and be critical and say, what aspects are the things that we need to preserve? And maybe AI is not useful for that. Or, or maybe if we're reframing the question so that you're applying your learning context with your personal context, and all of a sudden there's that richness, that combination, maybe that's what we should have been doing all along instead of, you know, insert date here, insert, you know, generic answer here that I could Google in a minute. Can we scaffold and differentiate our instruction? Yes. Do we need to spend the hard work of retooling? Also, yes. Welcome back to another episode of Beyond You. Today, I'm joined with my co-host, Ben. Ben, it's great to have you. Always a pleasure, Tori. Well, and this week, we're going to continue the conversation on artificial intelligence. So if you were with us in our, our last conversation with Kenny Jang, we started that conversation. And this week, we're going to pull in our friend Tommy Lister to this conversation about artificial intelligence. And today, we're going to do a deep dive on the impacts of artificial intelligence on higher education and even other forms of education. And so, Tommy, we are so excited about the conversation today on artificial intelligence and the expertise that you're going to bring to the table. Thank you. Uh, Tommy is newer to Team Oak Woo, yeah. and so we're grateful that he serves as our associate provost. Tommy, what is a provost for those that are listening? Yeah, so, I mean, it's the assistant to the uh, provost, uh, if you will. So we're going to bring in the, the office reference on yeah. that once more. But, uh, the Dwight Schrute. The Dwight Schrute. The Dwight Schrute um, of Oakland, mostly. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Um, no, but it's really the goal is to serve faculty, to serve um, students and making sure that our educational processes are cared for. Uh, and so really um, the provost's job is to safeguard that whole you know, policy and procedure and make sure that we're all um, clear and kosher and all things. And so my job is to support the provost and I'm excited to be here and honored, honored to connect with you all today. Well, that's awesome. And you bring to the table a whole host of experience in education. So you bring higher education experience to the table, but also K-12 education experience. Yeah. Talk to us just a little bit about your journey through education um, and what led you to Oklahoma Wesleyan? Yeah, it's a good question. So, I mean, in his heart, a man, you know, makes his plans, but the Lord determines the footsteps. So yeah. I, I told God as a very young man, I was going to be a classroom teacher in the third, fourth grade would have been a sweet spot. And um, graduated at just the right time for all the things to change. And so I ended up taking my um, very K-5 elementary education background and transitioning to higher education, uh, where I spent the better part of 15 years now serving that capacity. And so I have a, I have a, a deep loyalty to the classroom, um, but then I've also served in online and hybrid program development for the last 15 years at schools around the, schools around the world. And so it's exciting to be part of. Um, it's a lot of change. And so uh, in all of these passions and all of my background serving in both of these contexts, my, my heart is always for the teacher and the student relationship. And so safeguarding that and, and caretaking that despite or regardless of the modality that they're, that they're serving in or teaching in or learning in. Which is so cool. Like when you talk about this conversation, just to jump in for a minute, Tommy, when you, I mean, cause that, that, that teacher student relationship, if that's, that's that right. kind of the yeah. epicenter of the educational experience, totally. AI and technology is another kind of dimension of that, right? Yes, so it is. Yeah. Give us an idea. Just, I mean, because I know you are involved in your own academic work and some of your pursuits. So tell us where you are in your journey and, yeah. and how you've kind of landed in this space around education and technology. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, going back to that, you know, where, where God has led, um, you know, having served in the K, in the K5 context or K12 more broadly, um, my, my heart and passion was to see those those student moments and see that that rich relationship being protected. When I landed my professional career, everything was online. So everything was how do we how do we reach the students that are farther? How do we take this mm -hmm. teaching moment and and this this classroom context and all of a sudden broaden it out to uh, you know potentially a global population of students? And so, as higher ed, especially, but even more recently with you know post pandemic realities, K twelve, they've had to deal with this online as um, as a newfound reality that they're that they're teaching in that they're learning in, um, and for you know it's goods and bads. There's there's pros and cons across the board, but how do you make that the most redemptive, you know, the strongest learning process, strong efficacy in, in teaching and learning, and and again to protect that relationship has been sacred, and so so mirroring that even into my graduate work, that's really the focus that I've been spending my time. Um, pouring into that conversation and safeguarding that with the introduction of AI, that's a whole new lens, right? Because now we're 
it's not just the classroom that's changed. Now there's right. maybe the teachers changed or maybe who the students are interacting with has changed. And so that's, that's bringing in a whole new, a whole new level of complexity that, that mm -hmm. teachers are having to deal with faculty in our case uh, and, and students as well. So it's newfound complexity all the time. And I, I think in what you just mentioned there, you bring up, I, I think the reality that we're in is that AI is not a fad that's going no, away anytime not soon. Not at all. So talk to us where we're at with AI and, and its integration in educational spaces. And then maybe we can even kind of pivot towards where's this thing going? Because if it's not going away, yeah, we want to, we don't want to get left in the dust on this. Totally. Yeah. No, wh where it's at. I mean, it's relatively new, still in, still in realm. And so we've year and a half to two years and public consumption is, you know, more than that behind the scenes, but um, with chat GPT and Gemini moving down the line, we're starting to see like the evolution. And so now there's iterations, now there's versions, now they're releasing new and up, you know, updates all the time. Um, and I would say that, you know, the early adopters were, um, you know, it's kind of novel. It's this idea that the students can, can access this thing that maybe they had to be on a special list to sign up for, but now it's being pushed into your inbox, regardless of mm -hmm. what platform. And even if you weren't seeking it, I mean, you're getting advertisements for it and they're, they're putting the widgets on the, on the web pages and everything. And it's built into, you know, your apps across the board. And so we're seeing this, we're seeing this, um, pervasive throughout all of our, our digital ecosystem and throughout all of our, um, you know, context, regardless of, you know, professional, academic or otherwise. And so it's, it's everywhere and it's not going anywhere. So the reality is, you know, this, these first iterations were novel, kind of cute, kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Look at me, I made this cool little whatever. Um, but now it's, it's everything it's baked in. And so even to the point where, you know, conversing with faculty, conversing with students, like, Hey, be careful with AI. Also here's Grammarly that we're expecting you to leave all the time. Right. Like it's, it's the both end. So you know, like yeah. be very careful, but also your search engine is kind of functioning for that um, and has been your GPS is making decisions for you, like across the board, it's it's in everything. And so, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, when the smartphone came out in the, you know, 2007, eight is, you know, range and started, oh, it's novel, it's kind of cute, some people have it. Now you couldn't, you, you couldn't, you know, fathom not having that with you. And so I think AI is going to be a very similar trend mm -hmm. where this, this once was a cute thing that early adopters had, but now everyone has it and it's baked in and it's expected. And even to a point that you'd be, um, somehow digitally shooting yourself in the foot if you yeah. weren't engaging it in some way, like if you're going to say, well, I'm just going to shut down every app that asks me to use AI, mm -hmm. um, and not use it, uh, you're going to pretty quickly find that you don't have banking you don't have GPS and you don't have, you know, communications at a basic level because it's being, it's being introduced across the board. So that's, that's where I'm at. And, and now the classrooms, you know, the, is, you know, where we're going to be experiencing that in the higher ed. Yeah. So l let me just kind of jump on that for a minute, Tommy, just to, to kind of get your, your brain. Cause, cause one of the things you mentioned is when it comes to AI, we're getting all sorts of mixed signals. Totally. Right. So some people think it's, you know, awful it's going to ruin our lives some people think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread and so you know some people say not to use it and yet it's everywhere it's ubiquitous and so it creates this ambivalence towards ai for you as you think about where we are now yeah. and where we're going um what are the implications specifically for education and for our purposes today for higher education when it comes to ai yeah no it's, it's really good and so you know bringing bringing in the you know, the light and the dark, if you will, like with the good and the bad on the dark side, you know, we're, we're seeing, we're seeing educators, we're seeing administrators, we're seeing teachers very fearful for principally academic integrity. I would say that they're most concerned right out of the gate that all of a sudden there's going to be a, a huge influx of academic integrity violations of students that are, you know, engaging in cheating of some kind or submitting work that's not their own. Um, we're seeing this across higher ed, you know, news right now in general. And so there's this, there's a rich, um, and a newfound uh, clarity or, or uh, mindfulness around academic integrity. Um, but when you peel that layer back a little bit, you actually start asking teachers, well, what, what behind that bothers you? Mm -hmm. I would say that the principal fear that most teachers have uh, is related to the lack of deep thinking. They're afraid that mm -hmm. students are gonna be engaging in um, or using artificial intelligence and then skipping the hard work of forming or developing their own learning or understanding of a concept or concepts um, that in some way it cheapens the way that they're going to engage their their education. Um, and, and you can kind of, you know, the way that I often think about learning is it's a little bit like going to the gym for your mind, right? So you're, you have to lift weights and you have to run the laps and you have to do the things, whatever it is. 
in order to strengthen and condition your muscles. Well, your mind is the same. Like it's this element of you have to condition, you have to train, you have to go through the hard work of making meaningful and long lasting learning. Uh, and if you're outsourcing that hard work, are you somehow cheapening what you actually gain in the long run? Mm -hmm. um, on the, you know, on the light side, you know, for thinking, well, maybe there's some redemptive aspects. Um, and there's, there's some, there's some educators on this side too. They're saying, wow, this, this is opening up new avenues for tutoring, for scaffolding learning for students. All of a sudden, instead of being a one to a 30 ratio or whatever it is you, in, you know, whatever context, now this AI might be able to provide what may feel like a more one-to-one -one, uh, interaction where they can ask questions and say, well, what does this mean? And can you help me get examples of this? And, and all of a sudden students that may be on the most vulnerable uh, educational path um, now can have extra resources. We're thinking second language learners, we're thinking students that have um, alternative learning conditions or otherwise that may be, um, that may find that these AI supports give them the leg up that they need to move forward. Um, and that's pretty exciting. And so what that means though, is that, stu that students and teachers have to embrace it together. Yeah. There, there, there's a togetherness of saying, use it this way. Also, I will use it this way. Also, we're gonna agree that we're gonna communicate how we're using this. Um, and maybe maybe fruit can be produced out of that. Uh, there's also for me, the tactic of, you know, working with faculty for so many years of switching from, if you can Google that answer, was that an answer? Was that a question worth asking? <laughs> Um, maybe not, like maybe there's an opportunity for us to look at our, our teaching and be critical and say, what aspects are the things that we need to preserve? And maybe AI is not useful for that. Or, or maybe if we're reframing the question so that you're applying your learning context with your personal context, and all of a sudden there's that richness, that combination, maybe that's what we should have been doing all along instead mm -hmm. of you know, insert date here, insert, you know, generic answer here that I could Google in a minute. Um, and, and that conversation, you know, leads to, you know, can we offsort, you know, or outsource the administrative load onto AI? Yes. Can we scaffold and differentiate our instruction? Yes. Do we need to spend the hard work of retooling? Also, yes. And so I think there's that element of, of all of the above on both of those. I tend to lean more on the positive side. I'm hopeful, um, but it's going to take some work to uh, make sure that our academic integrity questions are answered uh, from the gate. For sure. One of the things I hear you saying in that is this concept of stewardship, right? Yes. So it's a resource to steward. And in our previous conversation with Kenny Jang, we talked about um, AI being a resource not to be feared, yeah, not to right. be misused, but it, it's truly a resource that presents an opportunity unlike any other resource that mankind has known at this point. Right. Um, can you talk from a Christian higher ed standpoint for just a moment about this concept of stewardship and how how Christian spheres of education need, need to really prioritize this concept of stewardship so this thing doesn't get out of hand like some fear that it could? You know, the, the verse that comes to my mind always is those that are faithful with a few things will be put put in charge of many things, right? So in this moment in time, I think there's a critical question that we need to be asking, were we being faithful stewards mm -hmm. of what we were given prior to this arriving? And in some cases, yes, and in some cases, no. And is this an opportunity to, to, to go to God and say like, uh, Lord, you know, challenge my heart. How was I, how was I succeeding in this? And how was I already uh, doing that well? So to ask the questions of, of now and then, uh, before I ask the questions of, you know, aiming in the future, because I think there's an element of retooling ourselves that we need to be more thoughtful of, wow, we, we have been given the gift of being able to serve and being able to teach, uh, being, a, being part of the formative process for all these students as they're coming through our doors and, and wanting to make sure that we are faithful to that calling. You know, there's, there's stark warnings for teachers in the New Testament of like, yeah. do not teach wrong. Right. Um, don't teach those kids wrong. There's millstones in your future. I mean, this is a big deal. And so, I mean, obviously in our context, as we're teaching young adults and we're forming them through, you know, traditional and graduate work, uh, there's an element that still needs to be honored that the teacher is, is held to a higher standard. And so when we're thinking about the technology use, there's also that element too. So it's, it, you can't be the teacher that uses AI to help generate your lesson plan. If you're then going to forbid the students from engaging AI to write their, right. to write their work, like that's, that's not fair or ethical or balanced, but you should be the teacher that says, Hey, this is how you do it. And this is how mm -hmm. a Christian thinker thinks about these things. And this is how a, an ethical, responsible, 
um, wise steward of the gifts that God has given um, would engage these things. So don't be left behind by it. Don't fear it, but also engage it in a way that's ethical and go- ethically uh, God honoring. And so I think yeah. I think in all of those pieces, that's the way that I would I would frame it. Yeah, it's it's kind of like money, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, obviously Scripture says the love of the money, love of money is the root of all evil, right? And and so it's interesting to think about technology. And, you know, this is part of our broader conversation about AI is it really is important to develop a theology of technology yep. right. and to communicate right in these spaces. OK, what is it? How can we steward in a way that that facilitates human flourishing the way God intends? What That's are the right. dangers? I mean, it's the same conversation that you might have with different things, right? It's just different totally. expression. Yeah. You're, you're so, exactly so, I right. mean, if, if, if Tommy, if the, if the core of education and, and I agree with you is really fundamentally about student teacher. Yeah. Uh, what are some things that we need to be aware of that AI might might undermine or yeah. hinder yeah. that relationship or, or that exchange between student teacher and the learning process? Yeah, no, I, I love that question. And that's I think I think that's the question about AI that keeps me up. It was a very similar question with online, uh, online teaching and online learning as well. Like what 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 about that teacher student or student teacher relationship or engagement? Uh, would somehow be watered down or a layer would be added. Yeah. And, I, and I think it's just that if you are finding that the use of AI is now removing you from context or removing you from con- um, being connected with your students, then you're doing something wrong. If And if your students are similarly not needing you, the teacher, I think there's something. It's not to say that, um, well, I can ask questions of the AI and they get they get back to me faster. That's true. That will always be true. Um you know, 40 at our window for a faculty, maybe in a, in a two minute or a two second window for an AI, depending on which one you're using and what, how complex your question is. But I, I think there's that element of, I don't know how, how often you all engage with, um, you know, the digital operators, right? Like you, you chat in or you call in or whatever it is. And you're like, ask me a question. And you're like, uh, this question, like, I don't understand. I'm going to give you 15 <laughs> links to some other website. Right. And it's like, that's not helpful. Um, and Currently, AI is a lot like that, I think, in a lot of contexts where you're like, here's my complex question that I need help with. Well, a, a caring teacher would be much more responsive and much more engaged to help like, nuance that, to bring that into context, to, to color that and give um, give a broader perspective and protect worldview as well. Like there's this element of like, you're asking this question in this way. What I think you mean is this, right? Oh, yeah. OK, so let's unpack that together. And so for me, you know, AI is, a, is an asset as long as it's not removing the teacher from the mm-hmm. student and, and, the, and the student from the teacher. And it becomes a liability when it does. Um, and I think that's where we really center around that. That's where we're really focused to say, OK, this is a tool that's now allowing you to scaffold and serve a bunch of students simultaneously. Great. Uh, this is a tool that's now removing you from having to engage your students at all. Not great. Like, stop. Like, go back to the drawing board. So. Well, and I, I think I hear you saying like this is not giving us permission to pass off creative thinking to a That's machine. Right. That's um, right. It actually, in some ways, raises the water level on what we can do as relational human beings. That's right. Um, and, and spheres of education. And so, talk to us just a little bit about how you, and maybe it's even in your own personal experience or the experience of others that you know that you have seen almost a greater human flourishing in the classroom, whether it's student or teacher, um, through. AI's ability to help us think more creatively. We're not passing that creativity off. Yeah. But do you have like an example that you can give us? Because some people might still be on the fence about this. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good one. So again, thinking about the positive side, right? So um, I'm I'm v- deep into my dissertation research and I've, I've spent the last several years gathering and chronicling. This is before AI. And so I had to do the work, you know, by hand or whatever. Um, and, and it's, it's laughable, right? Because I use search engines and Google, so I don't have to leave my couch while my <laughs> teachers all said, I actually had to go to the library and their teachers actually right. had to like find the scrolls. Right? Like, so, so we, we go back in time and we, and we see these things now they've changed. And so hard work for me, I had to Google it easy work for the next, but when chat, when, when chat GPT, the AI interfaces first started surfacing, I was curious. And so I just said, give me, here's my dissertation topic. Give me the top 15. Uh, resources that I would need to write that dissertation topic. And with about an 85% efficacy, it produced the articles that I had spent wow. years gathering. That freaked me out. Like that right <laughs> out of the gate, I was like, that's not fair. Like I, 
I spent hours and days and weeks chronicling that data. And it was like, yeah, you probably need bat, 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 bat. I'm like, ugh, unbelievable, right? Like, so that's nonsense. Like, that's noise to me. Um, would I advise my future students to use that in that way? 100% yes, mm -hmm. right? Like 100%, I would say that's how, type in your topic of, of consideration, ask for it to produce for you a bunch of resources. And then instead of spending time searching resources, spend the time in those resources mm -hmm. and then weigh them. Um, but, you know, Tori, you brought this up a little while ago, like this idea that um, there's still an element of, um, there's still an element of curation. There's still an element of, of being wise, you know, with, sure, that, that with that stewardship content, concept, that stewardship, like, like you need to, to look at those things yeah. and be critical and you can't separate that critical nature, but it, maybe it gives you more time to, to spend with those resources. And so right. on the creative side, I mean, you have, you know, music being generated by AI now art, uh, you know, uh, illustrations, paintings, you know, physical art is being generated as well. Um, and so, you know, there's this element of what's the value, right? If you could tell AI, hey, paint for me a cow wearing a spacesuit flying to Saturn <laughs> and do it in a, in a Monet style, you know, interpretation or whatever, like it can do that. And within seconds, it's got something. Um, and is that valuable? Um, or if I, if I was so interested in said space cow, like would I hire a, you know, a painter to do that or do it myself and, or ask one of my children to do that? Maybe that would be more meaningful. Uh, and so there's an element of like, what piece of this carries value forward. Um, my daughter's picture of whatever on the fridge is significantly more valuable than anything uh, that an AI could generate. So that's where the creativity kind of comes into, into how we revalue things, how we restructure things. For sure. So, you know, Tori and I, you and I, you and I were talking about this the other day, that, that part of the biblical narrative, right, is at the beginning of Genesis that, that God creates Adam and Eve to create. Yeah. yeah. Right? Part of, part of, of being created in him as image is this, capacity but also responsibility to move things forward in the way that that god intends right so in this whole space of education what advice would you give for educators to use ai to inspire and to create not does that make sense because i think part of the yeah. perception is students are just going to use it to do their work for them to write their papers right. for them which is the antithesis of creativity right right so so what advice would you give to people in the education space or in the parenting whatever it may be of ways that we can steward AI to actually help us to create the way in the way that God intends us to, and not just have somebody else do our work for us. Does that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. And I think it's a complex one that each person needs to do a little bit of soul searching on what God's asked them to do. I was recently listening to something and they were talking about, um, kind of the modern trend of feeling like when you walk into a place of business or service that you are, uh, a burden to the people that are in that place. Like you walk in and like, nobody wants to help you. Nobody like, Oh, I can't believe you're here. And it's kind of a new phenomenon, but, um, or, or it seems more, more heightened, maybe post pandemic, I guess you could say, but this idea that maybe somebody in that environment could step up and, um, and be nice and be proactive and be, and all of a sudden like control the market. Like, I think the same lands here too, when we're thinking about AI, um, you know, be creative. Like, well, there are firms now that start their day, whatever project you're working on, run it through AI first, use that as a baseline and then go through and fix and color, customize, color, change, adapt, modify, manipulate, whatever it is, use it as the starting point to kind of clear out the cobweb, get your engines going. I mean, that kind of thing. When you enter that, that mind state of flow, when your mind is just, yeah, I got this. I mean, how many times have you stared at a blank paper? Like I'm going to start writing, <laughs> right? Like any day now that first sentence is going to fall. Um, and if somebody's like, here's three sentences just to get you going, like all of a sudden, okay, I can build off that. I wouldn't use that first one. I'm going to start over. And so I think the same goes for education. The same goes for parenting. When we're thinking about how to help our students walk through this. It's more of the question of, yeah, use that as a baseline and be critical. Uh, ask questions, change things, modify. If you were to do it again, what would you keep? What would you get rid of and why? And all of a sudden we've taken it from, you know, kind of this, the cursory or superficial or, or, you know, entry level response, like here are the three things. Now we can say here are the most important three things because I vetted and removed and modified and, and taken it to a level deeper. And so I actually think in this context, again, when done correctly, when done proactively, where we welcome AI into the proverbial front door, uh, right? Like we're bringing it in knowingly. Um, and then we say, use it this way and, and take it further. That's the hope, that's the dream. Instead of writing a, I mean, 
dumb thing I would say write papers in education because we're all worried about the way that students write papers. Um, but instead of writing that five page, 10 page, 20 page, whatever it is, you're not going to write a 30 page, but you're going to use AI as your base and you're just going to go further. Or maybe it is that 20 pages, but maybe it's better. Like maybe it's higher quality, maybe it's richer. Um, or if you're designing or creating or, you know, use that as the base to get your engines going. And I think that's, I think that's pretty exciting because we're able to take that creativity and now apply critical thinking and now apply, um, you know, that weight, the, the measure to make sure that it's of quality and of, it's of, it's of um, excellence, I think, in everything that we do. Well, this is exciting for those that um, see this as an opportunity, but there, there very well might be some, and I'll admit, like early, early on in the conversations of AI, there was a lot of hesitation that I possess. Like, sure, is this out to replace people? Is this out to yeah. replace? Like, there's that common narrative, and maybe we see it in only certain circles that shall go uh, or remain nameless. However, sure. yeah. um, I'm wondering if if you could speak to the this notion of it's not AI that will replace. Yeah. Um, human jobs. It's the people that know how to use it. I think that's you kind right. of spoke to that yeah. in this idea of letting that be the base, and yeah. then it frees us up to be more creative. Um, wh what would you speak into someone right now? Maybe they're an educator. Maybe they're a student yeah. uh, that's kind of wrestling with where do I sit with AI? Like, is this going to replace my job? Should I change my major? Sure. Um, because of AI, like, speak a little bit of words of wisdom to those folks right now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, right out of the gate, the first thing in my mind is do not fear. Like, there, we're not we're not to be a people of fear. We're not to be a worried. We're not to be afraid. We have, right. Our God is king. He is, his throne is not in jeopardy. Um, we know where our citizenship is. All those things. So naming those things out loud is, is the first level of confidence that we have. The second level is I agree with your statement completely, Tori, and that is AI is not going to be replacing jobs. AI is going to be... Um, is going to be replacing roles within those. Like it's going to be replacing the levels or the granularity or the, or the singularity, if you will, of those moments in time where these, um, where these functions or these tasks can now be done at an expedited level. And so even as I mentioned a moment ago with like, what would it take for us to be the most excellent in our field? That probably means grabbing AI by the wrist and saying, this is how I will use it forward. Mm -hmm. This is how I can reshape my job and having that conversation with your, um, with your employer, with your, with whatever, whatever it is in your context and saying, this is how we're going to make this better. Um, you know, the, the common example we say is like when cars came, it replaced the wagon makers and the horseshoe, like, like that's true, right? That's an easy example. Like, okay, we had a whole lot less blacksmiths that are functionally putting horseshoes on horses. Like they're still out there, but they're not as, it's not as prevalent, right? Okay. But now we have all of these designers, we have all of these mm -hmm. elements, we have all this thing and they were, they're created new. They're still in transportation. They're still engaging in the function of helping somebody get from point A to point B. Yeah. But now they're in an opportunity that they, that they have more creativity, more autonomy, more control. Maybe that, maybe that's an opportunity. And so even in this, you know, I've heard of companies um, in the, in recent news where it's like they laid off 150 people because AI it's like, well, what if the, people that they didn't lay off are the ones who could use AI, right? Like maybe there's an element of like forward engagement on that. That's, that's creative, that is creative, but I think there's an opportunity to go to those same employers, the same bosses, the same context that maybe you're the company owner and say, maybe I, maybe I shouldn't be burying my head in the sand, but maybe I should be grabbing this forward. Mm. And maybe, maybe this is the opportunity to see that exponential growth. You know, we have the content, you look back in time, like, man, what would it mean to be a, an inventor of Microsoft, a Bill Gates or whatever, just the right time at just the right place, right? right? Like he was oh, so lucky. Maybe we're in that moment right now where people need to be saying, wow, so lucky. I was there in my profession at the dawn of AI and I was able to help see it go to the next level. Like yeah. that is a much more um, encouraging, much more um, in, in enriching possibility of hope where we can say, no, lead it, lead it forward. And for our right. context, you know, we're thinking, ah, we have all these amazing alumni at Oakwu who are engaging forward and we need those Christian leaders in those contexts using this in the right way. You know, the, the Skynets and the iRobots and all the things like not when our alumni are engaged, not when they're watching, not when they're present and accounted for. And I think that's really exciting. Yeah. Let me ask you, Tommy, just some kind of an ethical question when it comes to AI yeah. and education, right? So. So one of the bedrocks, one of the foundational things in education is the whole idea of attribution, yeah. which, you know, essentially means that if you write a book, when you write your PhD, if I use that, I want to make sure that I give you credit, right? That's, totally. that's kind of sort of the, one of the bedrocks that education is built on. 
So what are the implications for AI around some of those ethical issues in education like attribution? And, and maybe we can talk about a couple others. Yeah. How, how do we navigate that? Yeah, no, it's, it's such a good question. And I, and I think the simple answer is if you didn't author it, you need to attribute it. Like if you didn't create it, if you didn't design it, if you didn't write it, you need to say who did period, end of statement. That's you've solved all of the attribution problems. You've solved all the integrity problems. If you just say who did it, that's no longer an issue. And if your faculty has a problem with how much of that or what percentage of that is in your final document, then that's a different conversation, but it's not an integrity conversation. It's not an ethical conversation. Now it's a, okay, I see 60%. Don't do 60. Keep it belief, you know, keep it below 15. Okay. 15 is good. Okay. That's whatever the number is, right? Like I'm using numbers arbitrarily, but this idea that once you say, I didn't write this, somebody else did. And it maybe in this case, you know, AI did. Um, all of the, you know, APA and MLA, they all using their ours are already AI generated. How do you attribute mm -hmm. it? Put it in your bibliography, name it, cite it, quote it, put it in brackets, whatever you're doing. Done. That you've solved the problem. Literally, that's it. That's the whole problem. You've solved it. Um, cheap advice for all of the universities out there. We've we've fixed it, right? Um, now if we get our professors and our presidents and all the other, you know, the, all the all those things to start doing that as well. Now we fixed other problems. But you know, just to name these things out loud, that's that's the extent. Now we teach our students, that's how you do it in business too. So you go to your boss and you don't try to mask this as your work. Look at what I did. You know, I spent all this time and then secretly you're not. You know, if the, if the spirit's convicting you, you're probably doing something wrong. But if you walked in and said, hey, instead of writing 10 pages today, I wrote 20 because I used AI to get there uh, and they helped me along the way. Like boss is going to say, cool, 20 is awesome. I mean, that's, that's how you do that, right? Like Mm -hmm. So name it, claim it, who did it, whatever, <laughs> give it the right att attribution, cite it, put it in your bibliography, call it a day. That's that's it. We've solved it. Okay. Well, let, let me ask you just a follow-up question. So you've got kids, Tommy, right? And, and I do. And yeah. I've got kids and right. And and so you've got a heartbeat for K through twelve in your background and mm -hmm. still have that in some way and college students, which is great. Mm -hmm. So if, and let's broaden this out from just teachers. If your parents and your kids are in school right now and they're bringing mm -hmm. home the Chromebook or whatever it is from school, mm -hmm. how do you start to talk to your kids about AI in education? Yeah. How do you start to kind of, because we have this capacity, right? Um, yeah. To be able to kind of filter through it and have these conversations. But if you're yeah. six years old and if you're eight years old, I mean, how, so I, I put, put on your dad hat for a minute, yeah, totally. you know, yeah. and, how do you talk to your kids about AI in education? Yeah, no, I, it, it's such an important one. It's one that my wife and I have talked about quite a bit, not just with AI, but with all things digital, with all things apps. You have to be careful what influence is coming into your coming into your home and coming into your children's eyes and their hearts. And so I would say that it, it takes being proactive. First of all, you need to be engaged. You need to be sitting there with them, watching what's going on and, and helping them to um, helping them to separate, you know, the wheat from the chaff, helping them to identify, this is a good use. This is not a good use. This is why, you know, do you understand? But there's also that teachable moment, right? Like I, I look back and, and I was reflecting on this in preparation for this conversation. My teachers, when I was young, calculators were the AI problem of our day, right? Like you can't use calculators to do math. Don't use calculators. It's cheating. And so I carried that. I mean, I was that, I was that, God, you can't use my friends are like, look, I do it so fast on a calculator. And I'm like, Oh, you know, and so what did our, what did our good, good math teachers, the good ones, they said, show your work. Oh, the calculator kids. That was the bane of their existence, right? Like, oh, show my work. But look, I have, you know, 10, 10 lines. Each answer is perfect on that line. I'm done. And, and the teachers, that's not, that's not showing your thinking. That's not showing your development. And so there's an element of, I wouldn't introduce it too soon. I would element, I would introduce it in gradual steps and I would do it while sitting with them, while coaching them, while teaching them to assess it. Um, so there's that, there's that incremental approach. There's that gradual stair step scaffolding that you would do with your kids. But when you get to the end of that, you know, the conversation is still, if you wrote it, you wrote it, but if they wrote it, they wrote it. So make sure you've noted that. Make sure you talk about those yeah. ethics um, up front, out front. We curate everything that comes into our house, right? We have to, we like, what are you watching? Netflix. What are you watching? Okay. <laughs> let's, let's go to that. Like, well, I want to watch. No, you can't just watch anything. You're going to tell me what it is. You're going to walk me. So and you're helping them make these decisions. Ultimately, we all want to see our kids grow up faithful, you know, God fearing. We want to see them successful, thriving humans uh, moving forward and furthering his kingdom. Um, and there's an element of trust, too. And so 
you know, like, hey, we keep our laptops in the living room. That's what we do. Like, just that's just one layer of protection. And so all of those things, I can go on a dad mode all day, but, <laughs> um, but I think the idea is that you want to walk with them stair stepped and, and cautiously, For but sure. not hiding it, not I removing it. Yeah. yeah, I think that's so important because, again, the tendency is to stick your head in the, head in the sand or to just embrace totally. all that it is. And we just need – I mean it's parenting in general, right? leadership in general, just about helping totally. people to steward this. I mean, that's kind of the conversation is to be wise with this. Exactly right. Exactly right. When we steward this well, when we use AI at its highest capacity yeah. um, with human responsibility um, yeah. being central in that conversation – Tommy, what gives you hope, especially when we think about education and where education, maybe let's drill down specifically into higher education yeah. and, it, and AI's impact there. What gives you hope? What What's on the horizon that you're saying, this is new territory that because of this, we can get there? Yeah, yeah. Um, the thing that gives me hope is that we're having these conversations, frankly. Um, the, the conversations that are happening now that I, I don't know if they've never happened in the history of education, but online did it ai is doing it there's this question of um questioning the realities that we've assumed to be true all along we've assumed that because the faculty is in the classroom they're teaching well uh, they use the same you know yellow legal pad for the last 40 years maybe maybe not right like we assumed that lecture was efficacious lecture is not efficacious and it's forcing teachers to reassess the way they're teaching students on a regular basis and so similarly when ai enters the classroom we assume that our lesson plan design structure, you know, function oriented, we assume that that paper was meeting the learning objectives of the class. Maybe it is, but maybe it isn't. And maybe this is an opportunity for us to reassess, to do some critical thinking of our own craft and not just assume that the way that I did it must have been the right way, um, but maybe to take this uh, forward and say, what's the best way or what's, what's an improved way that I can support my students in their learning? And so for me, the fact that we're asking these questions, the fact that teachers are circling around the table and saying, what are you doing? What am I doing? You know, what, how is this applying in your class? Do you have any examples? That's enrichment. That's, that's growth. That's professional development that you can't, you can't pay for that. Like you, that's, that's a, an organic, it's come to us and now we can do something with it. And so the best schools, the best faculty, the best universities, they're the ones who are circling the tables and saying, let's talk about these things uh, in a new and profound way. Um, and again, that's not necessarily throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We're not saying like everything I've always done is wrong. That's not it at all. There may be some really good things that we want to keep, protect, double down on, but maybe there are some things that we could change. You know, one of my favorite examples in the last 15-ish years has been flipped learning. Flip learning came, you know, faculty were, some faculty were doing that prior to that, but it kind of became popular, a very trendy word in education. It's like, well, I'm going to flip my classroom. Like, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to send my lectures home digitally or whatever. And when they come to class, they'll do their homework. Like that's the, that's the basic summary of what a flip classroom is. Well, that's pretty novel. And so they say, well, how do you lecture at home? Well, historically, we couldn't lecture at home. Mm -hmm. Like you couldn't. There's no way for you to be in everyone's home uh, all at once doing your same lecture over and over again. It's impossible. But now with digital media, you can and so now in the classroom, you can do the hard work of wrestling with the questions and parents are rejoicing when faculty are effectively doing that <laughs> because the homework is watch this 15 minute lecture or lesson or whatever it is, movie, short, whatever it is, listen to this audio book, whatever, and then come to class with your questions. So the teacher can then be the one engaging like that is that's turning it up, upside down and that and then such a meaningful way, because now the classroom can be that place of active learning, active engagement, teacher sent teacher student centric rather than, you know, being uh, lost to administrative task or otherwise. And so asking the questions is what I'm so excited about. It's great. Tommy, thank you. Thanks for taking the yeah. time to be yeah. with us today to, to carry this conversation. I've enjoyed it. I'm sure our listeners will as well. So glad you're part of the Oku team and uh, grateful for your uh, space today on the Beyond You podcast. Thanks for joining us. Honored to be here. Thank you all.